Do you have reflux, indigestion, acid burn, bloating, maybe even a, <clears throat> the constant clearing of the throat, extra ear infections, all of those things? One of them or all of them? The answer is these are all reflux related, upper gastrointestinal related. And in the program, we're going to show you the complete reflux solution. We're going to be working through some really simple strategies to be able to reverse them, to be able to reverse them absolutely now this is based on over a thousand studies that are put together literally in a book that will be published one day soon but also 20 years of going around and running seminars with people who i've given solutions to have come back we've talked about it now at this point i want to make it clear i'm not a medical doctor i'm the guy who does the research and reads the journals and speaks to the people not dish out the drugs so please understand my role here i'm not the medical doctor i have a phd and was a, an associate professor at university so let's get into it first of all when it comes down to it there are lots of conditions that are closely and intimately related and the first one you've got dyspepsia indigestion reflux gastrointestinal reflux disease uh, erosive reflux disease, uh, LPR, which is the one I was talking about, laryngeopharyngeal reflux. That's something that I actually developed about eight years ago, so I had to work out a program how to reverse it. Barrett's esophagus, and right at the end is esophageal cancer. And now these are all linked along with lots of other conditions. So I want to show you how not to stop the symptoms but to actually reverse the process to stop it occurring. Now, medication is fantastic. Things like your proton pump inhibitors, uh, which stop the acid production, are fantastic for controlling symptoms, almost as good as nutrients. But the problem with them is they come with serious and deadly side effects. Yes, they do. There is no way around it because they interfere with the digestion and can actually make it worse and exacerbate the condition. So here we're dealing with the underlying conditions, what can we do? What steps can we do to make sure we don't get reflux so we don't need these or any other things? Typical symptoms you see in a combination of these are heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia, when the food sits in the, in the stomach or, or, or around about the stomach and it just doesn't want to go here an hour or two or three afterwards. Uh, chest pain and bloating. Uh, nausea, and then you've got a, a whole raft of these other little chronic ones that occur for people, and they probably don't even realize. For example, chronic cough, clearing uh, and a sore throat, laryngitis, asthma, ear infections, dental erosion, tooth decay, mouth ulcers, all of these. Uh, you know, it, it ear infections in kids, people don't realize it's probably related to the acid reflux and even with that acid reflux bringing up and creating the wrong type of microbiome in the mouth. Yes, it's all related. And these are all in the scientific published studies. And then we've got right down to bad breath and constipation as the end of it, so to speak. Pardon the pun. But what we've got here is all these conditions and many, many more are linked with it. So we don't want to just cut out the acid, which is necessary for good digestion. We want to get to the root cause of this and have something that's sustainable for the rest of our lives. Because first of all, these conditions don't just come on their own. And this is again where the drugs don't work because they look at one little area rather than the, the big picture, the whole human that you are. So we've got all these comorbid conditions with reflux and the studies show that these conditions are higher in reflux, not because of necessarily reflux, but because of the underlying conditions, inflammation, oxidation, poor digestion, linking back and so on and so on. So it comes back, you've got a lot of gut issues. Obviously, you've got a dramatic increased risk in the, the rates of celiac disease right through to uh, stomach ulcers, right through to uh, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. Now, all of these, including rectal cancers, by the all of these increase if you've got any of the conditions of reflux. So what we want to do, if you hold on, which one do you want to treat? One of those? No, let's treat the underlying causes. And then we got here mental health. There is a link with mental health and reflux. And it's not because you're, you're feeling depressed or anxious because you've got reflux. The studies actually show that the uh, mental health, some of the mental health conditions can precede the reflux. And you'll, ex you'll understand that later on when we talk about the gut brain axis as a part. Metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular risk, hypertension, um, uh, blood sugar levels, diabetes type two, all of these things 
have links with reflux. So if you've got reflux, you're at increased risk of all of these. And if you've got any of these, then you're at increased risk of reflux. And then you've got respiratory problems from chronic respiratory conditions right through to respiratory infections increased with reflux. And all you've got to do is imagine that whatever's coming up here is also getting into your lungs. Yes. So you can understand why and how the role of reflux can play havoc with your respiratory conditions as well. And then autoimmune diseases. So there's a strong link between reflux, upper digestive disorders, poor digestion and autoimmune conditions right through from things like fibromyalgia, right through to all the different forms of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. Um, then, you've got, uh, then you've got gout, which is linked to it. If that's not enough pain in there to get you moving to action. But so many of these conditions, in fact, the more I look into it in the studies, the more I find it hard not to find a link. And when you understand the importance of the digestive system for providing all of the nutrients and rebalancing the gut microbiome, then you understand that we need to take action. So hang in there for the next 30, 35 minutes, and I'm gonna show you what you can do. The figures suggest that around 10 to 15% of the population have reflux on a very regular basis, a frequent basis. There's about 30 to 40% who have it on a kind of a monthly or two monthly, three monthly basis. 70 to 80% have it. I actually think it's closer to about 100% of the population will have reflux at some stage. It's this kind of silent epidemic that people are only talking about when they're trying to sell you drugs. The great thing is there are solutions. And if we understand the causes, then we can make these steps. I should comment also that infants have very high rates. So up to four months of age, infants, 40 to 50% of infants can have reflux. Now, this is also called something colic, okay? But fortunately, by the age of two, it's around about four to 5% as the digestive system develops. That's the primary role of it in there. And so what causes reflux? It's really simple. There's a whole list of causes. This is not the full list, but it gives you a bit of an understanding of what you need to be looking at. The first one is Helicobacter. And I've got a great video on eradicating Helicobacter. So if you think you've got Helicobacter, stomach ulcer, you really do need to look at that video. Uh, the links will be down below. Um, and any, any, in fact, any gut dysfunction, so that might be a major dysfunction in the large intestine even, because it all relies on signals being sent around the body and coming back. Uh, antibiotics and medications, in particular nosaids, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, some of the really common over-the-counter uses can actually cause reflux. So you're using any medication, always check with your pharmacist to, that, it may be causing the reflux. Just double check, it's always worthwhile. Um, spine misalignment. Now, not many people talk about this, but it's very common. And in fact, if you think that the whole nervous system coordinates your digestive system, then you can understand the importance of your spine and the messages that go around. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, spine misalignment, very common. Psychological stress, again, through the gut-brain axis, can shut down your digestive system uh, at every single layer that I'll show you in a moment. Um, extra weight, uh, ladies, unfortunately, also during pregnancy. But there are some really simple strategies that you can do during pregnancy to minimize that. And that's a bit of a physical one that literally just gets in the way. Um, carrying extra weight has multiple uh, ramifications, not just the physicality of it pushing against your, your, your stomach and so on, but it also alters some of the biochemistry in there as well. But pregnancy, certain things you can do about it. Uh, smoking and alcohol, allergies, food sensitivities, and triggers. There are lots of foods that can cause it. Trigger it and exacerbate the situation, and you'll understand why when we get into it. But the next stage is with all of these, what is causing them? What is it? What is the, the factors leading? What do they do? What do they cause? Well, it's pretty simple actually. And I, I put this model together so you can understand it. And so all the GPs and uh, medical people can understand it as well. From a physical perspective, what happens is you've got two sphincters, two rings of muscle, one at the top of your stomach called your lower esophageal sphincter. 
L-E-S. You've got one at the bottom called your pyloric sphincter, which means acid or fire sphincter. That's at the bottom of your stomach. And what happens is these hopefully control the movement of everything out of your stomach and into your stomach. So from this way, it opens up, uh, the LES opens up, allows the food in, and once the food's in there, it closes off and doesn't let any more food out. Pretty simple, isn't it? Would it be great if we could just say, okay, get working like that? We can. And there are some really simple strategies to help with that LES, and they call it the tone or the LES tone, the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter is what will determine what comes up the esophagus and then um, back out as, as reflux or acid burn and so on. Then you've got this one, which makes sure that it opens up and goes down. And there are two factors in there. One, you wanna make sure it opens right up to let everything out so you get emptying of the stomach. Secondly, you wanna make sure it closes off so that nothing else goes up because you actually can have bile reflux. So it's come up literally through the sphincter, up through the stomach and regurgitated through the esophagus and so on. So we need to make sure these sphincters are moving. Now that's from the physical component. There's one other aspect that is critical from the physical component. And that is what's called the MMC. And it's called the migrating motor complex. Don't worry about the terms too much, but just the MMC. And what it is, it's the movement through the digestive system. Something has to keep them moving, even in your stomach. You've got the muscles in there and they go, boom, boom, boom. This is part of the MMC. When it goes into your small intestine, you go, boom, 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 pushes it through. Large intestine, boom, 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 pushes it through. So this migrating motor complex is the thing that gets things moving. So together, in, movement through, out, movement all the way down and around and out of the body. They're, I suppose, the three critical aspects of reflux that people really aren't putting together. What determines their activity? Are they gonna function properly or not? And there's lots of factors in there, but I'm going to summarize it so that you can already start to see some solution. One is hydrochloric acid. That's the stomach acid. And your stomach pH, interestingly enough, regulates all three of those one way or another. It sends messages to close off at the top, open up at the bottom and get the movement going. But then it sends messages down and there are enzymes in your stomach, bile, neurotransmitters and some other factors that will all influence how it moves through the intestines. Because if nothing is moving in the intestines, it'll tell you not to send food down. And if it doesn't send the food down, it sits in the stomach. And as a result, you get all these complications. So it's not just about increasing one or two or the other, it's about understanding it a little bit and taking steps to get them all moving at the same time. Sounds sensible, doesn't it? 